Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. The last day of uh, classes today. We'll just wait for uh, a few more people to join. Okay, we'll uh, begin. I will, in the meantime, people will join us. Uh, can somebody lead us in prayer this morning, please? Can anyone lead us in prayer? Yeah, go ahead. Father, we come to the throne of grace, Lord. Thank you for this day you have given us, Lord, this Friday. Whatever we will be learning from your word, Lord, that it should not be just kept in our heart, but it should be manifesting in really in and Lord, it should be revealing by our nature, Lord, by our daily work, the daily works at our day-to-day -day life, Lord. Lord, whatever we will be learning, Lord, it should be used for the expansion of your kingdom, Lord. Whatever the CDPC Bible College is putting in our heart, Lord, let it should be blessing, it should be a blessing for us, Lord, and it should become a fruitful tree, Lord, in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, so we are doing, uh, we are in chapter 3. Uh, we come to the last part of chapter 3. So can a few of you tell us um, what we, were been, we, we have been learning in chapter 3, please? Just one point, each of us, each of you can share. So what did we study in the doctrine of God? The nature and the attributes of God. Okay, we are basically studying uh, the nature of God and how do we know the nature of God? One through his attributes and through his? Through his word, through Holy Spirit. Okay, the, the Word and the Holy Spirit reveal to us uh, the nature of God, that is, it reveals to us the attributes of God. Uh, but what else reveals to us the nature of God? One is His attributes and the other is His? We studied about it uh, in the last class, towards the end of the last class. What did we study? After we studied the attributes of God, what did we study? Names of God. Yes, we study the names of God. So we uh, we looked at um, uh, the nature of God. Uh, the nature of God is revealed in His attributes and in His uh, names. Okay, so we looked at uh, a few attributes of God, and then we began studying uh, the names of God. Now, before we studied the nature of God, um, what else did what did we look at uh, in the beginning of uh, this lesson? in the nature of God? What is the question that we answered? How do we know that God exists? That's the yes. one we answered at the beginning. Yeah, so we looked at, uh, you know, uh, thank you, John. Uh, we looked at, um, you know, the, uh, we answered the question, does God exist? Okay, and then we looked at uh, a few references and then we moved on to studying the nature of God, uh, which is revealed in his attributes. And then we began studying the names of God. Okay, now the names of God are used to describe, uh, which are used to describe God 
tells us more about his character and his being. Okay, talks about his nature and his very uh, being. We looked at a few common um, names of God. We we looked at Adonai. <clears throat> Adonai means Lord or Sovereign. And it's not a name that is exclusively used only for God. It's also used for human beings, uh, to those who are masters, owners, those in authority, those who are in supreme authority. Okay, um, so we see that it's a title that is used for God and for men as well. Now, the Greek word for Adonai, what is the Greek word for Adonai? If you don't want to Kuros. unmute your mics and speak, you can type it in the chat section, your answers. Sorry, Lubega, go ahead. It is called Kuros. Okay, thank you. It's called Kurios. Uh, it's the Greek word for Adonai. And we saw uh, it appears in several places, but we just saw one reference in Genesis chapter 19, um, verse 2. Okay, uh, then we moved on to the next common name of God that is Elohim. Uh, and where do we see this uh, this name Elohim revealed to us uh, first in the Bible? Genesis one one. Genesis one one. Thank you, Lubega. Uh, Genesis one one, and it's basically talking that you know, as God, He's the source of all creation. He's the powerful God. Uh, that is what is the meaning of Elohim. And we also see uh, the Greek. Uh, form uh, a translation of this word Elohim in the Greek is Theos and we see this where in the Bible in the New Testament? We've been looking at this chapter again and again the last few weeks. It is in John 1.1. 1, 1. Thank you, John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, where it's uh, talking about, uh, you know, the Logos create, who is God and who is the creator. Okay, so uh, this word Theos is the Greek equivalent, uh, or the name Theos for God is a Greek equivalent for um, Elohim. Then we looked at another uh, name of God that is El, uh, which means strength, uh, power, or might. And we looked at a few na El names of God. Uh, we saw El Shaddai, we studied El Shaddai, uh, and we all know the meaning of El Shaddai, okay? We looked at uh, El Shaddai means the Almighty, the Bountiful One, the All-Sufficient One, and it is revealed to us, uh, God revealed this name first to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, when Abraham was 99 years old. Uh, God had promised to him, you know, almost 24 years back that uh, he would have a son, uh, he and uh, his wife Sarai will have a son and it's uh, almost 24 years and they haven't seen the promise fulfilled and God uh, appears to uh, Abraham and says, uh, you know, when he was 99 years old and said, I am El Shaddai, that means I am the almighty God, I am all sufficient, I can do, there's nothing that is impossible uh, by me and I will keep my promises. So El Shaddai, the next uh, El name of God we saw was El Elyon, and we saw where it appeared in the Bible for the first time in Genesis chapter 14, uh, verse 19. What does El Elyon mean? Anyone remembers? El Elyon? Most High God. Okay, the Most High God, and um, this name was spoken by uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, when he blesses uh, Abram, when he comes back from defeating the kings uh, that had taken Lot and uh, the rest of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah as captives, and uh, he uh, blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God, most high possessor of heaven and earth. So, blessed be Abraham, uh, El Elyon, God most high. And also we see in the same chapter that uh, Abraham, you know, uh, gives thanks and blesses God and calls upon the name of God as El Elyon. So it basically uh, expresses the uh, El Elyon means uh, the extreme sovereignty of God. Okay, it ex expresses the majesty of God and his highest preeminence. Okay, I'll say that again, it ex uh, ex expresses the extreme sovereignty of God, the majesty of God, and his highest preeminence. Now, I'm not going to look at what uh, sovereignty means and what preeminence mean, means because we've already studied about it. 
The next name of God we looked at was El Olam. Okay, anyone remembers what El Olam means? The everlasting God. The everlasting God. Thank you, John. And um, uh, we the word Olam means world, universe, eternal, forever, everlasting uh, time or space. Now, some of this information I'm giving is not in your notes. So you could follow through with your notes. And if you want to uh, make your own personal notes, it will be nice. Um, so El Olam, the word Olam means world, universe, uh, eternal, forever, uh, everlasting time or space. So we understand uh, from this word Olam that the name of God, that he is sovereign, he's the eternal ruler of the entire universe, who, and he is beyond time or space okay so el olam is basically the eternal god without beginning or end okay eternal god who is uh, has no beginning and has no end uh, psalm 90 verse 2 says that before the mountains were born uh, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, uh, you are God. We actually saw this, um, we studied this verse. We also studied what is the meaning of uh, from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, the name of God, El Olam, also teaches us that God is unchangeable. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, we looked at this verse in the last class so when we studied about the unchanging attribute of um, God. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 26. Can somebody read that, please? Isaiah 37, verse 26. Isaiah 37, verse 26. Can somebody read that? Have you not heard? Long ago I did it. From ancient times I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. Thank you. So here we see that God's plans and his purposes are timeless uh, and he will not fail to follow through with them. So it is. it also means that he is uh, El Olam, the almighty God who is eternal and whose plans and purposes are uh, timeless and he will not fail to follow through with them. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 4 says he will not falter or be, uh, or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. Okay. This also reveals the uh, nature of God as, or the name of God as El Olam. So we read this uh, uh, word, this word is revealed first or appears first in Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, uh, when um, Abraham makes a peace treaty with uh, Abimelech at uh, Bathsheba. And there he calls upon uh, the name of God as El Olam. And it's basically him displaying uh, his faith uh, that this everlasting God would deliver uh, or his covenant or would deliver what he has promised, uh, the covenant uh, promise that he has given uh, to him, that his descendants, that Abraham's descendants will, uh, you know, receive uh, uh, the land or will live in that land. So what do we learn from this name? Now, everything we see uh, in the natural is uh, very temporal, is subject to change, uh, but like Abraham, you know, we should not be moved by what we see uh, since El Olam, who is the eternal God who created the universe, he will not fail or he will not go back on his promises. His promises are from eternity to eternity. He will not fail to accomplish his plan and his purpose. Okay. So even as we study these names of God, uh, we learned uh, you know, in when we did systematic theology that we when we studied about God as the creator, we said, you know, let it let it burst forth from us into worship in song and in adoration uh, for, uh, you know, who he is. He's a creator. Uh, he's almighty. Uh, his creation is so perfect. So even as we look at the names of God, you know, we can use this when we pray. You know, um, uh, when we pray that we just declare over ourselves, uh, you know, our families, people that we're praying for, we just declare the names of God. So even as, uh, uh, you know, you see things around that 
are subject to change. You might be discouraged, but you know, um, uh, just remember that uh, God is El Olam. He's the eternal God who created everything. He's a promise-keeping God, uh, and he will never fail to accomplish his plans and his uh, purposes. Okay, there are two more names, uh, the El names, uh, which are not there in your notes, but I thought I will just uh, mention that to you. One is El Rohi. Okay, uh, anyone knows what's the meaning of El Rohi, R-O-I? Shepherd. Okay. El Rohi is the God who uh, sees um, Genesis chapter 16 um, when Hagar, who is uh, the maid of uh, Sarai, and you know, Sarah takes uh, the step when she sees that God's promises is not fulfilled. Uh, she gives uh, her uh, maid uh, to Abraham and she conceives, okay? And um, when she conceives, we know there is a, a, not a good relationship between uh, Hagar and uh, uh, Sarah because uh, I think Hagar is mocking Sarah. And uh, so Sarah begins to treat Ab uh, Hagar uh, rudely and she runs away uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Sarah and Abraham. And she finds herself in her desert and... Uh, you know, in very harsh uh, conditions. And then we see that, uh, you know, she cries out to God and uh, God appears to her and speaks to her. And uh, then, you know, she declares his name as the God who sees. So the God who sees means basically the God who knows. Uh, so even as uh, you go through challenges and even as you go through difficult uh, situations, uh, just remember this, that, uh, you know, the God you serve, the God you worship, the God you know, uh, you, the God you've accepted is a God who sees. He sees, uh, uh, you know, what people cannot see. He sees your pain. He sees your difficulties. So El Rohi, the God who sees. Uh, the other name, El name of God, which I like to mention, which is not there in your notes, is El Kana. Anyone knows what's the meaning of El Kana? It means a uh, jealous God, okay? Uh, so we see this uh, name revealed in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. So can somebody read Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, please? Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Okay, so here the name of God is revealed as El Kana, uh, jealous God. Now, when we think of this word jealous uh, or jealousy, you know, um, uh, we have a totally different meaning. And so we can uh, uh, misunderstand this name of God. Today, because of relationships that are filled with selfishness, uh, you know, distrust, hostility, uh, uh, this word jealousy, uh, you know, uh, has a very negative uh, connotation. But when we are talking about God being a jealous God, uh, his jealousy is basically rooted in justice, in holiness and love and not like, you know, we uh, kind of uh, have this negative connotation of this word jealousy. But God's jealousy is rooted in his justice, in his holiness and his love. Uh, you know, it's a very, it's a healthy, passionate, burning this devotion of God for us and a firmness that he will not share his position, his praise, his glory with anyone else, with another. Okay, as we read in Psalms chapter 83, verse 18. So it's uh, basically, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Elkanah means jealous God is, uh, God is, his jealousy is rooted in his justice, holiness, and his love. And it's something that is healthy uh, and it's a passionate, burning devotion that he has for us and a firmness, okay, uh, or a perseverance that, you know, he will not share his position, uh, his uh, praise, or his glory with anyone else, as we read in Psalm 83, verse 18. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says, uh, you know, God says, I will not give my glory to another or my praise to 
idols. Okay, so God desires an uh, exclusive love relationship uh, with His people, and He expects us to be in total, totally in love with Him, and not share our love with any other idols or anything. Uh, you know, uh, we don't give uh, 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 precedence to anything than His love. We keep God. First, and everything, and everything, and everyone else after him. Uh, we read in Exodus chapter twenty, verse three, that uh, you know he does not want to share our love and attention with idols or with other false gods. And that is why, even Jesus, when was asked what is the greatest commandment, what did he say? What did he say was the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. So here we see that, you know, uh, being a jealous God, he does not want us to share his glory or his praise or his affection uh, with anyone else, worship to anyone else other than him, and also to be exclusively in a love, love relationship with only him. Uh, and that is why we have this greatest commandment where God says, you know, in the Old, we all, old Testament, we read this, New Testament also we read it, that we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, so that is Elkanah, the jealous God. Then we looked at uh, the name I am that I am, okay, uh, where God reveals himself as uh, the eternal one, the self-sufficient one, the self-existent one. And this name I am in the Hebrew, uh, you know, when we translate it, uh, the Hebrew word, it means to exist, to be, to become. And it is from this verb, it is from this Hebrew verb, which means to exist, to be, to become, uh, we get the name Yahweh or Jehovah, okay? And I said that uh, the Old Testament people never used to take the name of Yahweh on their lips because of, of the reverence and the fear they had for God, uh, but they used to use the name uh, Jehovah, okay? So we looked at a few uh, names of God uh, with Jehovah. We saw Jehovah Rapha. What is the meaning of Jehovah Rapha? God a healer. The Lord, our healer. Thank you. Uh, Jehovah Nissi, anyone else can answer? The, the, Lord Jehovah my Nisi? the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Thank you, Zilatoli. Uh, and we see this uh, name when, uh, you know, Joshua goes uh, with a few people, the Israelite soldiers, to fight against the Amalekites, Amalek the king. And we see that, um, you know, um, uh, Moses is, uh, you know, holding on his hand towards the, the battlefield and they win. But when his hand gets tired and he puts it down, uh, we see that they lose the battle. So, you know, two men on either side hold his hands and uh, throughout the day he's uh, stretched out his hand. And then he, when is the Israelites win the battle, he makes uh, a builds an altar, makes a sacrifice to God and calls on the name as, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord by banner, which means the Lord is my victory. Uh, so even as you uh, learn this name, you can declare this over your life that, you know, when situations, when you feel defeated, uh, when you want to be victorious areas, uh, or, uh, you know, in your life where you're facing temptations, weaknesses, um, fear, and you just declare the name of Jehovah Nissi, that he's your banner, he's your uh, victory, okay? The next name we looked at was Jehovah Jireh. Anyone remembers what's the meaning of this name? It's very simple. The Lord is my provider. The Lord is my provider. And we saw where, um, uh, thank you, the Lord is my provider. We saw this uh, name first appears in Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. Uh, and we see that Abraham calls upon the name of um, God as Jehovah Jireh, who is uh, the Lord, the provider. Uh, when he, uh, you know, provided an uh, an animal for sacrifice, and God, um, you know, saved um, uh, his son Isaac from being sacrificed, uh, and so he calls uh, Abraham calls on the name of God as Jehovah Jireh. Then we looked at the name Jehovah Shalom. Okay, what's the meaning of Jehovah Shalom? Thank you, Shubhasis. It's uh, the Lord is peace, but I said it's not just 
peace, but it's a very comprehensive uh, word. It means uh, more than peace. Uh, it means uh, well-being, wholeness. Uh, it means uh, 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 protection from evil, preservation from every kind of harm and danger, preservation, good health. It's, so it's a very holistic word. And so uh, that's what Jehovah Shalom means. And we saw where it appears first in the Bible in Judges chapter 6, verse 24, when Gideon calls upon the name of God as Jehovah Shalom, uh, when he's totally afraid that he's seen an angel and uh, he thinks he's going to die and God tells him, uh, you know, do not be afraid, you shall not uh, die, peace be with you. And then he calls upon the name as Jehovah Shalom. The next one is Jehovah Sabbath. Uh, we look at this name uh, today. What is the meaning of Jehovah Sabbath? The Lord of hosts. Thank you. The Lord of hosts or uh, Sabbath, the Hebrew word Sabbath means host or multitude. So Jehovah Sabbath means the Lord of hosts. Uh, uh, so this Hebrew word Sabbath uh, often has a military connotation, such as a group of uh, men fighting or an army, as we see in 1 Samuel chapter 17, um, verse 45, and Isaiah chapter 13, verse 4, where we see uh, you know, David, when he's facing uh, the Philistine, uh, Goliath, he tells him, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Okay, so the name Jehovah Sabbath, the God of the armies of uh, Israel. Uh, sometimes Sabbath also uh, refers to the hosts of heaven, uh, like we see in Psalms chapter 148, verse 2, and 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. Now, uh, some of these things are not in your notes, so if you're following with your notes, you can see it's not there. You can take down these references, look at it later on, and study it, and you can also make your own personal notes. So Sabbath also refers to hosts of heaven, as we see in Psalm 148, verse 2, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. It's actually uh, picturing God as the Lord of the multitude of angels, uh, which are numbered 10,000 times 10,000, as we read in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. Now, this Greek word Sabbath also is used to describe the innumerable stars in the uh, night sky, Psalm 33, verse 6, Psalm 103, verse um, 20. Okay, so the important thing uh, about this name of God is that, you know, whether it is armies that he's... Uh, uh, or whether it's a host of armies or host of angels or innumerable stars, Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts, rules over all things, both in heaven and on earth. So he is supreme authority. He's God over um, uh, the he heavenly host, of the angels. He's God of the armies of the world. He's God of the innumerable stars. We also learn that he call he knows each star by name. He calls them by uh, name, okay? So the first time this word Jehovah Sabbath appears in the Bible is in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 11. Uh, uh, you know, when this man went up, the city to worship and sacrifice the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Uh, that's Elkanah and uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 11, where we see that, uh, you know, Hannah is crying out to God uh, to have a, a, a child. She's childless uh, and she makes a vow and, and said, O Lord of hosts. So she calls upon Jehovah Sabbath. And she says, if you indeed look on my affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. So here we see that, you know, uh, uh, the name appears Jehovah Sabbath when Hannah calls upon uh, God as Jehovah Sabbath and she makes a vow that if God, you know, blesses the Lord of hosts, blesses her with a son, she will give him back to the Lord. Okay. Um, now, uh, Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts, is a name that emphasizes the power 
and the might of uh, God. He rules over the vast multitude of stars, angels, and armies. Uh, and yet we see first that this name, uh, which is such a powerful name, appears in the Bible, uh, and it comes out to the mouth of a very humble woman who is praying in her anguish, who is praying in her total distress and brokenness and shame uh, for a blessing from uh, God. And we see that Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts, hears, uh, sorry, hears Hannah's prayer uh, and uh, he blesses uh, her with a son, Samuel, and Hannah keeps her uh, promise. So, you know, Hannah's story actually tells us something important. Uh, it tells us that although God is indeed the Lord of the multitudes of the heavenly hosts or the angels, uh, you know, he's also the Lord of each one of us individually. Okay. Uh, he relates to us personally. He comes to us personally when we are weary, when we need his blessing. Um, in the darkest nights, in difficult times, uh, the Almighty, the Lord of hosts will hear us. He will comfort us. He will strengthen us. He will bless us. Um, even if you are the only person on earth needing attention, uh, you know, the Lord of hosts will minister to you, will console you, will provide for you. And also we see that uh, none of our troubles, whether it is small or big, is, uh, you know, that he will not notice because he's El Rohi also, because he sees, he knows, he notices. Okay. Uh, so whatever we need, we can cast our burdens uh, on him because he cares for us. As it says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, uh, also the psalmist, uh, you know, he cries out to God in Psalms chapter 34, verse 6, where he says, you know, the poor man cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. Okay, so the Lord of uh, the, uh, the, the Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts is your Lord. He hears you. He knows you. He sees and nothing is too small for him that he cannot uh, minister to, help, or care for your needs. Okay. The next name is Jehovah Mikadishim. Okay. Anyone knows what is the uh, meaning of this name, Jehovah Mikadishim? God who sanctifies. Thank you, the Lord who sanctifies. Uh, unlike the other names of God that we saw, which is appears in numerous places in the Bible, sometimes some of these names appear 262 times and all of those things. But uh, this name, Jehovah Mikdashim, uh, appears only twice in the Bible. One in Exodus chapter 31. Sorry, Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 to 14, and the other one is Leviticus chapter 20, um, verse 7 and 8. So can somebody read Exodus chapter 31, verse 12 and 14, please? And somebody else can turn to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Exodus chapter 31, verse 12. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Thank you. Um, and it says, You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Can somebody read Leviticus 20, verse 7 and 8, please? Somebody else? Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Uh, you shall consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Thank you. So in these verses, we see that Jehovah Mikdashim is described as God, as the one who sanctifies his people. Okay. Uh, uh, and he sanctifies his people, Israel, and makes them holy. He sets them apart as his own. And that is why he 
chose the whole nation of Israel, not because he's a partial God, not because he loves one uh, nation or people group over the other, but he chose the Israelites basically so that, you know, they can be a model uh, um, or an example to the rest of the nations around them. Uh, and when people, the other nations see them, they will know the God they serve, the God they worship, they will know the commands and the laws that God has given them, and they would, uh, you you know, come in relationship with God. So God chose them uh, to be an example, to be a, a witness uh, for him, uh, to present him before the um, nations. Okay, And it was God himself who said he will make them holy and set them apart as his own. Okay, So it's true of us even today um, as the church, as uh, the people of God, you know, uh, as each one of us are called the royal priesthood or holy nation, you know, God himself sanctifies us. He himself sets us apart to live holy uh, lives. And sometimes we, we feel very unholy. Uh, we don't act like holy people. We don't like act like the sanctified people that God has called and set us apart. But if you really notice what this name means, it actually is God himself saying that, you know, uh, in this verses that we read, it says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So it's not something that we can do on our own. It's something that God does. Jehovah Mikdashim, the God who sanctifies himself, will sanctify each one of us and make us holy. But again, um, knowing that he's a sovereign God, he leaves a choice to us. So the choice for us is that when we, you know, when we choose to submit and surrender uh, and come under his authority, that's when to that extent we allow him, that extent he will uh, work in us, to that extent he will sanctify us. And now we need to know that, you know, sanctification is not something, it's a one-time thing when we accept Jesus. Uh, of course, the Holy Spirit comes in us, lives in us, sanctifies us, it's just the beginning, but sanctification is a process. It happens throughout our lifetime till the time we um, die. Okay, so it happens throughout our lives, but it's important that we every day uh, recommit, resubmit our lives and come under his submission and authority so that he can continue to sanctify us to the extent and the degree he wants us to be holy uh, in his sight. And we also know the standard that God has set for us is be holy as I am holy. We studied about this as well. It's something that's not mentioned only in the Old Testament. It's also mentioned in the New uh, Testament. And that is the standard because God is holy. He wants us, his people, to be holy. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's making us uh, without any spot, blame, wrinkle, or blemish so that we can be presented uh, without any spot, blame, wrinkle, or blemish before the Most High. Uh, God. So it's God himself who sanctifies us, but uh, the part that we need to play, the choice we need to make is we need to submit and surrender to God. So times when you feel very unworthy, unholy, and you've done things that has displeased God, uh, you know, you can go on and, you know, pray and just call on the name of God as Jehovah Mikidishim and say, submit and surrender my life to you, sanctify me and make me holy and set me apart for your work, O oh, God. Okay. The next name of God is Jehovah Rohi. Anyone knows what's the meaning of Jehovah Rohi? Yes. Anyone in class? Jehovah, knows? My, Sorry, Jehovah my shepherd. Yes. The Lord is my shepherd. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, as the Lord is our shepherd, we all know Psalm 23. Um, I'm sure most of you know it, uh, you know, even by heart. So what are the characteristics of God as, you know, a shepherd? Can each one of you give me one, one attribute of God as Jehovah, the she Jehovah Rohi, God our shepherd? He leads, he guides. Okay, he leads, he guides. What else? Only John and Lubega have joined class today. What about the others? What are the other uh, characteristics of uh, God as our shepherd? Psalm 23. He cares, okay. 
What else? He prepares the table. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. He prepares. A, he protects us. He prepares a table before our enemies. What else? He corrects us. Thank you. He provides us with the richest of things, the best of things. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He leads me beside green pastures. Okay. Uh, he's somebody who gives us the best. What else? He restores our soul. Right. He guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, though we, even though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, which means when we go through difficult situations, you know, his rod and his staff, or even when we are facing near that experiences, his rod and his staff is there to, uh, is with us. That means his rod is something that corrects us, and his staff is something that guides us, comforts us, leads us in paths of righteousness. Um, and he does it all for his name sake. Okay. Yes. You know, he makes our cup overflow. We lack nothing. You know, those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Okay. Uh, he bountifully blesses us. He performs all things for us, like the psalmist says. Anything else? What are the last few verses that the shepherd does for us? As a good shepherd... Surely his goodness and his mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, right? And he's always there with us. He never leaves us, no? Forsake us. So that is Jehovah Rohi. Okay, the Lord is our shepherd. So even as you pray, use some of these things. It just enriches your spirit man, your sp soul. It just reiterates who God is. It will strengthen you. It will encourage you. It will also uh, help you uh, to know who God is. It And it will wipe away all the lies of the enemy with the truth of who God is and what he can do. The next name of God is Jehovah Siddu Siddiku, okay, or Siddikenu. Uh, and that is, what does it mean? God our righteousness. Thank you. Uh, the Lord our righteousness. Uh, and this name Jehovah Sidkinu or Jehovah Sidku appears twice in the Bible, again, uh, like the other uh, name of God that we saw. And both these times it uh, it appears in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 and 6, and Jeremiah chapter uh, 33. Okay. So it's Jeremiah chapter, just a minute, yeah. Jeremiah chapter 23 was 5 and 6, and Jeremiah chapter 33 was uh, 15 and 16. Uh, and Jeremiah says, you know, behold, the days are coming. Uh, uh, he makes a note of what the Lord is saying. God says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 and 6, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness or Jehovah Siddikenu. Okay. And Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 15 and 16, uh, again talks about the same thing and God is revealing his name as the Lord our righteousness. Now when Jeremiah wrote this book, the people were in exile in Babylon. Uh, Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed and God raises up prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and others who called God's people to repent from their sins and turn back to God. And they say that if they did so, then God will promise to forgive God's promise to forgive them. Uh, Jerusalem and the temple will be rebuilt and they would once more live in their land uh, with peace and uh, safety. So these two passages in Jeremiah are part of uh, these promises that God makes. Uh, the kingdom would be restored and a righteous king in the lineage of David would rule once more. And he will be called as Jehovah Siddikenu, the Lord our righteousness. Okay. 
Of course, the Jews did return back to their land. Uh, Jerusalem and the temple were rebuilt. But we see that no king ever ruled over the land after the exile. Uh, instead, the priestly elite governed under the general oversight of the uh, Persian Empire. So God's plan for his people was not fully realized because they never fully turned back to uh, God. They never returned back to God completely. Uh, so most Bible scholars uh, see these two passages in Jeremiah, which is talking about Jehovah Siddikenu, referring to Jesus Christ, uh, the Messiah, who would come to bring righteousness to all who accept him as their Lord and uh, Savior. Okay, so it is something that was uh, in the future and was fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who came and brought about righteousness. And he brings, continues to bring righteousness to those who accept him as Lord and Savior. The next name of God is Jehovah Shama. Anyone knows what's the meaning of Jehovah Shama? God being with us. Thank you. The Lord is uh, present. Uh, now this name Jehovah Shammah appears in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 35. And it's the name of the city that the prophet Ezekiel was shown in a vision. Uh, and, uh, and he was shown this name uh, Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord is there. Now when Ezekiel uh, receives this vision from God, the Jews uh, were in captivity in Babylon for 25 years. Uh, the temple and the city, uh, Jerusalem, were in ruins. Uh, but like I just said that, you know, God had promised his people that he would restore the city and the temple would be rebuilt. Uh, in the closing chapters of Ezekiel, the prophet describes uh, what God told him in the vision about the coming restoration of the land the city and the temple, and it, include, it included a detailed plan of the measurements of the, if you read Ezekiel, you know, that chapters, you'll see that there was a detailed plan of the measurements of the restored city. And in the final words of Ezekiel uh, in his book are these, that the name of the city uh, from that day on shall be called the Lord is there, Jehovah Shammah, okay? Um, which means that God himself will be present. God himself will live with his people. Uh, and, you know, this Jehovah Shammah has a very special meaning for the Jewish exiles because they felt forsaken by God when they were in Babylon. They felt that they were totally cut off from God. Uh, but, you know, this promise of him restoring back the city, restoring back the temple uh, and that will be rebuilt, and this very promise uh, that the Lord himself will be present, that he himself will be there, was a great assurance um, for the people. Okay. And then, you know, the last name of God is uh, our father, uh, which where does our father appear in the Bible? All of you, you know, hopefully say that every day. Say, the, say it in your prayer every day. Where does our father appear? In the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. In the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Um, and our Father is perhaps uh, one of the greatest aspects of God's nature that we must grasp that He is our Father. He's not just some God who's waiting to uh, punish us, to curse us, to put us down, to condemn us. But he's a loving God, a loving father. And, um, you know, some of us who have not had a good relationship with our father uh, or we've not seen a good side of our father, you know, we always um, also begin to think about our heavenly father in the same way, but he's not like our earthly fathers. Our earthly fathers, all of us have our own weaknesses, our frailties. Um, but, you know, our Heavenly Father is uh, all the attributes that we have studied about him, uh, all the names that he has revealed to us. He is just so big, so incomprehensible by us. We cannot even uh, comprehend him, cannot even, uh, you know, contain him in our little minds. He's so great. But uh, it's so wonderful that this great, big, almighty, all-powerful God uh, you know, who is uh, uh, holding on 
or who oversees everything or who created the hosts of angels and and the stars and the planets knows each one of us by name he sees each one of us uh you know el rohi and uh, he knows what we are going through and he will come through for us okay he's a good good uh, father so those are the names of god that um, uh you know is revealed to us in the bible of course there are so many other names you can do another study about it uh but it would be good to please go through your notes uh, study these and also you know keep speaking this declaring it over your lives and also when you pray you can declare the names of god over your life and also you know just declare and decree his attributes over your life that is chapter 3 any questions any doubts any comments you'll have no if not uh, we'll end class so uh, have a good weekend a uh, good restful refreshing weekend and we'll see you all on monday okay bye everyone thank you pastor